Please welcome Ron Saxton, Executive Vice President and General Counsel of Peace Health. Well, thank you. If you uh, found that last session interesting, this afternoon we're going to have a breakout, and you'll hear a little more about that, and I'd encourage you to attend that. Um, we've got a great panel here who's going to help us talk about how we take a lot of the news you've been hearing about the great prosperity going on in Oregon and do a better job of sharing it. So I'll introduce them as they come out, but let's bring the panel out here with me. Come on out. on my glasses so I get this right. <laughs> Anne is the uh, president of the Fa Ford Family Foundation, one of Oregon's largest philanthropic charities. The foundation focuses on rural Oregon, and one of its key focus areas is helping to build leadership in smaller rural communities. Welcome, Thanks, Anne. Man. Carmen is the exec, Carmen Rubio is the executive director of the Latino Network, a Latino-led education organization grounded in culturally specific practices and services that lift up youth and families to reach their full potential. Rukai Adams, Chief Investment Officer of Meyer Memorial Trust and Chair of the Oregon Investment Council and involved in a lot more activities I could tell you about, but we'll go there. Mark Witte, Superintendent of the Baker School District. Mark's a close follower of the Ross Chetty work that you were just hearing some about and is working with the Confederation of Oregon School Administrators to use his research to help districts think about cross-sector strategies to implement the Student Success Act and improve student success. A lot of words for a great group of people. So um, as we talk about the, the, this issue about shared prosperity, we've been hearing, you know, good stories here. Oregon's made a lot of progress. Uh, um, number of indicators, incomes are up, more jobs, employment down. John even showed that compared to national averages, we've made some progress. But we all know it's not reaching everyone. Right and that that's, that's really the challenge we want to talk about. So, um, you know, instead of too much of a look backwards at why hasn't it worked, what we want to engage in here is a discussion about, well, what should we be doing so this would work? And so, I don't know, Mark, will you start us off here maybe with a few thoughts about how we're going to make this work better over the next decade for folks here? Yeah, and uh, I guess what I can say is that I've been a witness over the last six decades of uh, Eastern Oregon. That's where I've spent most of my career, both as a teacher, a coach, guidance counselor, principal, and superintendent. And unfortunately, over that time, even though the United States has been going through an upturn, as the stats have definitely shown, there are communities and populations within that that have not, and certainly in Eastern Oregon we have not. Natural resource-based economies that dropped out in the late 70s have not been replaced uh, at the same level with family wage jobs. And so, uh, as uh, Jared Diamond would say in his latest book, Upheaval, he would say, sad, uh, at, with regards to economic mobility, sadly, the problem is making itself worse. Economic inequality has been increasing, and social economic mobility has been decreasing in the United States. Well, certainly, we're in communities that that's been the case. Um, quite frankly, our best and greatest export is clearly our children. Um, they go on to more urban centers where uh, things are thriving, which leaves us with, uh, with an economy that's not very uh, effective for us. And so what we need to do through SSA monies is invest in closing the opportunity gap that exists within our communities. Uh, currently, uh, if I went 10 to 15 years ago, I'll just use my hands, the variability in our kindergarten classes would have been this rate. So a teacher would have been giving these number of kids and this variability within that. Now, the variability is this. And so it makes it much more challenging for us to serve all children to get them to the outcomes that we want. And so through the SSA funds, we're going to be able to provide programming that will help lift uh, the group that doesn't have the capacity within their families to support uh, education. Remember, families are the first teacher and primary teacher of their children. Not all families come to us with the same capabilities, and we see that in, in uh, the outcomes within the school. 
Uh, measure 98, and I just want to mention that briefly, Measure 98 is another major component that the legislature has passed that has allowed us to really create BTI, Baker Technical Institute, that creates quality CTE programming for our students, yep. but also for adults within the region into a technical pathway. Uh, we're proud of that uh, opportunity and what we've been able to do there. What we hope is through this process, working with uh, Opportunity Insight, is create a collaborative. The reality is that K-12 education is not alone going to be able to create the workforce in the future that we need. We need, as has been mentioned with previous speakers, quality housing for all families. We need quality access to health care for all families. We need uh, strong educational systems. Uh, and finally, and, and maybe even most importantly, we need thriving local economies throughout Oregon uh, that can create family wage jobs. Great. Thanks, Mark. Want to just come along the way, Rakaya? Sure. Uh, this is such an exciting program, and I'm, I'm very engaged in the pivot uh, for the business plan toward uh, a more inclusive economy. As I listened to Mr. Williams present and John Tapania, what was clear to me is that we have embraced data as a tool for informing action. In addition to being open to broad categories of data, I'd like us to get to a point where we get more com comfortable with disaggregated data and facing some of the really painful information that will come out of it, like what Mr. Williams uh, put up uh, comparing black men and uh, white men. But I also would like to be able to do that with our urban and rural populations because there are so many assumptions built into who's in those rural communities, what's happening to the you know, folks there, what the educational attainment is. We know that historically some of our best minds in this country have come from our rural communities. We know that our economy is based on the food and fi food and production and fisheries and uh, creative talent coming out of our rural communities, yet we have all of these baked in assumptions about the people who live there and what life is like. <laughs> so I think we really have to get more comfortable with disaggregating the data and facing the consequences of the information that we receive. The second thing that comes to mind as I listen to the presentations thus far is that we have so far been thinking about the problem from a supply side and a demand side. The supply being well-educated, healthy people making their way into school systems and economic systems. And then on the, on the demand side, employers having policies that prevent discrimination um, in, in the sort of thriving, growing economy. Well, there's also one other aspect, and that would be intermediation. The, the, it, the kinds of businesses, people, organizations that are between the supply side of talent and the demand side in commerce, right? And those would be our banks, CDFIs, to some degree foundations, other capital sources that sometimes filter resources, opportunity, capital, that prevent our talented young people from moving from school systems to being economically uh, vital con contributors to our society. I believe there is a, a rising moral responsibility for our intermediaries, and we should pay closer attention not just to their financial outcomes, but to the ways that they impact externalities and problems that we have to deal with at a societal level. And the third thing that I'm thinking about as we talk about a more inclusive economy is that this is no longer a social discussion. At this point, I think we've moved into this being a national security issue. We need well-educated women and people of color in our workforce, in our military, producing new ideas, generating economic activity. It's no longer an ask. If you could imagine all of the women in the United States military no longer being there. What would happen to our supply and logistics leadership? What would happen to some of the science and math that goes on on our nuclear destroyers like the Nimitz? This issue of inclusion and economic output isn't a social issue anymore. Now this is an issue for economic growth and perhaps even the United States role in the world. We need every kid, all hands on deck, for inclu you know, inclusive economic development. We cannot take a quarter of the population, perhaps half of the population, and diminish their capacity to help us all grow. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I wholeheartedly agree with my colleagues up here, Mark and Rakaya. I think that Oregon has an unprecedented opportunity um, if we do focus on using disaggregated data together with the opportunity that the, social, uh, the Student Success Act brings. That could be a tremendous game changer for students in Oregon. Um, data clearly shows that our education systems are failing our students right now today. Um, and I truly believe that we need more school and community partnerships with trusted organizations to be um, the next partner to our school districts and to our local economies and business leaders as we re-envision what we need to, to support our future workforce. These are people that are going to be con future contributors to our, our tax base. And um, when we think about culturally specific nonprofits, um, and this is probably true for most safety net nonprofits as well, we have become, our existence was born out of failure of public institutions to serve the hardest to reach in our community. And so when we think about that, out of necessity and survival, our communities have had to develop strategies that get to root and core issues that we know best how to address. So, that isn't enough. We are now in a landscape where we have awareness, we have data, we have seen outcomes, and we have seen organizations produce real change in communities. Institutions must partner with local communities around data-driven solutions that have been proven to be true over time. We have enough resource, we have enough knowledge now to partner in really meaningful ways we have education and wisdom that resides within the community to make the changes that we need to meet over the long term. Uh, along with that, um, there are key outcomes to developing um, these partnerships that will be critical as partners to success. Not only is it opportunities for learning from community, institutions, yes, can learn from communities um, to create change, but also it's the mutual trust building for a lot of these communities that have had experienced trauma or a lot of um, uh, terrible histories um, with public institutions um, in our country. And that is a fact of life that we live with the legacy of that every day. And that's evident in our outcomes. The other thing I want to talk about is also that education is a vehicle for economic mobility in this community. And um, community-based partnerships are the energy for that vehicle. So we really can't move forward in solution unless we are working together. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. Anne? Well, I think I'll just reinforce some of the points that my predecessors have already made. I'm going to focus specifically about rural communities because the Ford Family Foundation focuses on rural community development. And I want to just reinforce Mark's point that rural residents of rural communities start out with far less access to economic opportunity and opportunities for social mobility than, our, than their rural, um, count, I mean, their urban counterparts. Um, my colleague Heidi Kokar from Rural Development Initiative says rural is its own inequity. And so on every single measure of socioeconomic well-being, our rural residents and our rural communities are faring worse than, than um, their urban counterparts, especially in Native American communities. And it's the only inequity in our state that's actually getting worse over time. And the structural changes in the economy have served to increase those in inequities. And just for example, in my home county of Douglas County, in 1980, our median income was 99% of the state's median income, and now it's 78%. And in Lake County, it's 58%. And in Malheur County, it's 66%. Um, and not surprisingly, we see sort of the socio, we see the social problems that often accompany poverty in terms of. Um, <clears throat> mental health issues, substance abuse, child abuse, and so on. So I think my first point is that we desperately need a rural development policy that takes into account the realities of rural residents' lives and the reality of what's happening in rural communities. I want to also talk about what we have learned over the course of the last generation about what works well for community revitalization and economic revitalization in rural communities. And to say that the traditional approaches, the traditional ways we think about economic development, which focus on sort of providing incentives to attract businesses to rural communities, just don't work well for our rural communities. Um, where we have had successes, where we have been able to attract through, through economic incentives, those, those companies have not changed the structure of opportunity for our rural residents. So we really have to think about different, the, the solutions that are currently working, and there are a lot of what has already been talked about. We need to think about how to retain and expand our existing businesses, because existing businesses in rural communities are rooted there, they hire locally, that we need to make sure that we retain them and expand them. 
Um, <clears throat> we've also learned about this, this notion of community participation and sort of seeing the future of your community. I heard a very powerful sort of um, uh, statement the other day. Someone said that Oregon's rural communities need to build a future story for themselves. And the good news is that we at the Ford Family Foundation, we know about where there is the energy to build a vision and a future for rural communities. We have been able to support some of that, uh, that the process of bringing communities together to create a future vision and work together, plan together, implement those plans and lead to community improvement. And I just want to give you a couple of examples because these, these communities are collaborating across sectors, they're collaborating across ideological divides to think about what their future needs to look like. And so a couple of examples are in the Illinois Valley. I hope folks from the Illinois Valley are here. They created, hey, there they are back there. They created a strategic vision, a 2020 strategic vision that was about people, place, and prosperity. And they have already seen successes around things like public safety and um, attracting workforce housing. I want to give another example of the little town of Adrian in Eastern Oregon with a population of 200. They've developed a, a future plan called Adrian 2040, and they've already brought in a farmer's market, neighbor watch, plans for new sidewalks, and most important for community building purposes, they've got new lights on the football stadium and they can now have <laughs> Friday night football games again. But I can tell you about examples that we've been working with across the state. There's Klamath Falls, there's the Lower Sayusla River, there's the five towns in Southern in Lake County, there's um, the town of Independence, the town of Willamina, they are all places where the community has come together to, to develop a vision for the future, develop a plan and implement that plan. Wonderful. So we've, thank you. So we've heard in the earlier panel or presentation in our group, you know, rural problem, it's an urban problem, crosses lots, but we still come back to this fundamental that the prosperity is growing, it's not being shared. And what I want to pose to each of you as a, a, a next round of questions is, how do we avoid us sitting here 10 years from now having the same discussion? You've, you've got ideas, you've talked about ways to come at them, but I want to get even more pointed. We've got a lot of policy makers in the room, we've got a lot of business leaders in the room. You know, what do we need to do to get this moving faster? I don't know, start, would you, one of you want to jump in there first? Or? Well, I'll, the, well, I will just start by saying that I think we need to recognize the assets that we have in communities, that we have to be honest about the, 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 the policies that haven't worked and say that there's a lot of energy in our communities that is really, that's aching to get out. And at the very least, government policies can't have to serve to not drive business away and have to not bring in the old models, but the new models that are building on the assets of the community. And I want to just say one thing again from the perspective of rural communities. I think we are witnessing an incredible socioeconomic and demographic change that's so important for our rural communities. And I call it the Latino revitalization of rural communities. As, as, the, as the white population ages and their kids move out, as you're saying, Mark, um, who's coming in? To, to work and replace and to work in the fields, we are actually, after all, a natural resource-based economy. It's the Latino population, and they're, as they come in, their kids are in the school. And in Ontario, 60 over 60 percent of the kids are in, in the school district are Latino. And and as they settle, the Latino families are buying property and they're running for school boards. And they are the future of rural communities. And I think, and we have to recognize that, embrace it, and build on it. Wonderful. Well, Mark, I, I would add two, two things if I could speak to the legislators in the room and policymakers. Um, one, uh, it is incredibly difficult. Uh, collaboration, I think, is going to be the key across private and public sectors. We've got to collaborate. And multiple siloed bureaucracies are very difficult to go ahead and get that collaboration that's necessary to, to get to an outcome. Uh, early learning is an example. And so the more we could do to streamline and make it easier to work together, the better off we would all be. We could then utilize that resource actually uh, to the outcome as opposed to trying just the bureaucracy that sets it up. So that's one. And then two, as I look around this room, I would highly suspect that almost most, if not all, uh, pathway to this room was through a four-year or 
uh, a degree of some type of that nature. And policymakers, as a general rule, have graduated from college, and they have a tendency to make policies that work for them. And the reality is that our economy has a huge demand for technical training. And anything that we could do that would uh, create opportunities for technical training for our youth uh, to develop workforce-ready workers to go into the private industry and actually do the work, we would be better off. We need to change our culture around this notion that you have to get a bachelor's, master's degree to be successful. It's not true. Technical training can get you into a wonderful middle-class lifestyle, and if you happen to have the ability to, to want to move forward and own a business, it'll do much more than that. Well, I, I might throw a hand grenade into the room right now with these comments. So I, I agree with Mark. Um, I would say the thing we have to face is fully funding pre-K through terminal education, whether it's a right. technical degree or, or four-year college. We just have to prioritize education funding. If, if, if your plan is one year, you plant rice. If your plan is 10 years, you invest in banks. If you want to go for a long term, you invest in children and educating children. And I just think we have to stop hand-wringing. We know how to educate children. We know it, how it has to be done. We have to fund, fully fund uh, childhood education in the state and just, just decide that it's a priority. Now, with that said, uh, here's where the hissing is going to come in. Uh, I think we really have to rationalize our revenue structure. It's time for a serious conversation about how we fund these things that are such important social and moral priorities for us. And that uh, focusing on how we fund those in our revenue structure has to have some conversations about how much we pay in tax, what kinds of taxes we have. And the corollary to that at the state level is to manage those funds in ways that give the public confidence that the outcomes they want to achieve can be achieved. I really think if we want to do this, we know how to do this. We know that educating children is important. We know that the role of our uh, business development and uh, business functions of government are critical. So let's coordinate those functions, let's fully fund education, and then hold our public servants accountable for results. And I think then we'll get to a point of having an inclusive economy. We have the tools, we just need the political will to actually use them, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, as the leader of an education nonprofit, um, I truly believe that education is one of the greatest single points of access of opportunity for communities. Um, uh, but we can't also, and, and we are huge believers in pre-K education mm -hmm. as well. That is the single most like uh, uh, leveraged investment you can make early, early on that has such predictive value for success in life. So pre-K education is a critical need. It's, it's a right that all our children deserve in this state. Um, but I also want to say that we also cannot afford to just think that our um, our major responsibility stops at, at um, pre-K through 12. Um, in fact, it's a lot of the focus um, institutionally is on K through 12. We need to look at it as a lifetime of education, the trajectory of the, of the child's experience. And um, higher ed access um, ha is the, the biggest opportunity that we have to create generational permanency in economic mobility. And I feel like that is something that we cannot afford to overlook when we're looking at demographic changes, when we're looking at um, making sure that our students educate and complete high school. Um, but we need to look at those critical transition years that are not just um, uh, determined by institution where you just have pre-K siloed from K-12 siloed from higher ed. We need to really think about a seamless system from the user end, and that's from the family end. They experience those tra transitions, and those transitions, if, if there's a drop in support, can make the uh, all the difference in the direction of their lives. So I think on, uh, it's incumbent upon us as uh, community leaders, um, educators, institutional leaders, to create ways that we actually have a, a student-centered approach to education so that they're feeling seamlessly supported all the way through their workforce experience. Carmen, I love that barbell concept. We get the middle part of the education investments okay, but the early childhood and then uh, post-high school life, we still have some work to do, and those are the critical levers for mm -hmm. economic 
vitality for all of us. Absolutely. And I, and I would just add, I think that the, the Student Success Act has been, I mean, it's a game changer, as we know, for, for our state. And the fact that in that legislation, there's 400 million allocated over the biennium for early child mm -hmm. development and early childhood education is absolutely an unprecedented opportunity mm -hmm. for us. I have the privilege of serving on the Governor's Early Learning Council, and one of the things that I think we, we want to make sure that we keep alive is that this is a long-term investment that we have to make. This is a, a huge change for us for right now, but we need to build the workforce, we need to build the facilities, we need to build all of the infrastructure that allows us to take advantage of this incredible investment and make sure that, it, that we do a great job with it and that it pays off over time. We had this moment in the, in, where the legislature really delivered for us and we have an obligation to figure out how to use that appropriately but we don't have the workforce we don't have enough facilities and so we have to all get behind that to make sure we take advantage of investing in our future well I, I would add uh, another strategy that's often often missed um, we, we uh, in k-12 feel like we can do a great job getting that student to the 12th grade and and graduated uh, once they graduate, if they don't have the network around them to support them into the post-secondary world of training, um, they'll often fall off the vine. Yep. And we need to be considering, and I, I can give you a straightforward example. My, my daughter went to BYU Provo. The second day there, she calls me up in tears and telling me that, oh boy, I can't do this, I can't do that. I know as a father, I'm going to listen, I'm going to encourage, and she's going to be fine. And I tell her that. Um, but not all families, not all students that are transitioning have a network that's able to go ahead and support uh, that next step. And so I think we've got to be thinking about ways that we can, we can build networks for our children uh, outside of their normal uh, situation. So Mark, in your community, you talked earlier about uh, the need to break down silos. Are you seeing that? Are you seeing that in your community? I, I couldn't quite hear you. The, you, you mentioned earlier the need to break the silo. Oh, yes, yes. And about your community, are you seeing some efforts, some progress oh, there? You know, we have, uh, we have uh, I believe, 18 people here from Baker uh, County that are supporting, um, you know, the process of how we can make Baker County better for our families uh, that live there. Um, we have really utilized that as a district. Our board has been very clear that uh, collaboration with partners is going to be the way we're going to move forward. As an example, uh, our summer academy has 22 partners outside of the school district to operate summer academy for our uh, uh, younger kids. And so that's a wonderful example. We have 17 uh, partners, uh, both private and public, um, around early learning and what we can do within our community uh, to re create more slots, more availability, availability for high quality childcare, which I must point out is a basic barrier for many families and, and, and their, you know, the moms and the dads to be able to get into the workforce and be productive. Um, if you ever watch No Small Matter, you realize the military has made that a primary component of supporting the, their families that are at home while their spouse is serving and that those families have access to high quality mm -hmm. child care. The military sees that as a strategic um, push to be able to, to, to put the best fighting force forward. So we're going to wrap up here in a second, but any final thoughts from any of you? I would just say that um, we know that the need is great and we have great opportunity before us. And sometimes um, we can feel paralyzed about where to start or we don't want to start until we have something perfect. And I can just tell you the urgency is there in the community. Just start now, even if you need to start small through partnership or through um, replication of a, of a program um, that you know exists well in another community, um, that's important to do. And also uh, invest where the greatest disparities are because that's what it's gonna really take, focus and uh, laser-like focus on those, on those communities that have been experiencing the most disconnection. I agree. I would yeah. add. I agree with that, Carmen. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that we have an advantage. We're a small state, right? This is a this is a small family. We can gather yeah. and actually do something remarkable. So instead of thinking of our scale as a problem, I, I actually think it is is an advantage in this situation because we can pivot uh, if we decide to do that. And I would quickly add that inequality is in fact not only a challenge to national security; it's actually clearly a challenge to our democracy. 
If we cannot create a, a middle class where social economic mobility, and there's hope in the world, hope in our country, that you can make that middle class, it creates dynamics that are very difficult for democracies to handle. Mm -hmm. So it, that's a clearly important piece. Any last comment, Ann? Well, thank you. I think this has been a great discussion, and I think as we've talked, the, the need to not leave people behind, first, it's not fair to the people being left behind, number one, but number two, Oregon's missing out tremendously. And I think what you've heard here are some, some passionate views about what we can do, how we can do it. And I go back to the question I asked, you know, Rukaya said, uh, um, you know, national security, sort of, we must do it. We've had a lot of the, you know, we should do it, a lot of the, we can do it. And, and my challenge is then let's do it. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I here. don't want to be here in 10 years having this discussion. <laughs> right, right. So, uh, breakout session this afternoon at 3.30 at, uh, well, you can look in your brochure and see the room, but we're going to keep talking about how we connect Oregonians and how we deal with, uh, with uh, spreading what needs to be spread. So, thank you to the panel and thank, thank you. you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.